right, everyone, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father of light, from whom all good gifts come, send your Spirit into our lives with the power of a mighty wind, and by the flame of your wisdom, open the horizons of our minds. Loosen our tongues to sing your praise in words beyond the power of speech. For without your Spirit we can never raise our voices in words of peace, or announce the truth that Jesus is Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Mother of mercy. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Saint John Vianney. Pray for us. Saint Pio Pietrocina. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, no matter which one of a thousand roads you choose to take in life, At the end of that road, you're going to see one of two faces. Either you will see the beautiful face of Jesus Christ, or you will see the horrific face of Satan, and one or the other of them will say, Mine. When I have the occasion to give a retreat for a confirmation class or youth group, I will always talk about something that most young people don't think a whole lot about, and that is the shortness of life on earth, the certainty of death, the uh, immortality of the soul, and the concept, the reality of eternity. It's part of the subject that we call eschatology. Now, eschatology is a fancy-sounding theological term for the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell, and the fact that for all of us, life on earth is a pilgrimage. It is a journey through a passing world. And to make my point, I will sometimes use this uh, ancient Roman coin called a Cistercius that my father had given to me many years ago. It was discovered by an archaeological team of the University of Pennsylvania in one of their digs in the Roman ruins. And uh, it is still the oldest man-made thing that I've ever held in my hands. I'll be glad to show it to some of the kids when I finish this talk by the back table here. But on this coin is the image, the head of a Roman emperor of some historical note, because he reigned it for 15 years in the latter part of the first century from 81 to 96 A.D., when Christianity was in its infancy and the Roman Empire was at the height of its power. And this emperor was, from any historical perspective, one of the most powerful men who ever lived. He is the one who built the Colosseum. Uh, He was one of the ten emperors who persecuted the church. He is the one who had exiled the Apostle St. John to the island of Patmos in the Mediterranean. It was there on the island of Patmos that St. John wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And this emperor was so powerful, his temporal power was so awesome, so absolute, that he became the first emperor to pass a law, to issue an official imperial decree proclaiming himself to be God. And he demanded that his subjects address him by the title Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. And at that time, there were many people in the empire who thought that maybe he was God. At his command was the greatest army ever to march, the Roman legions. And by that time, the Roman legions had conquered most of the known world. He was the master. He had the power of life and death at his word. He could have a man put to death at a whim. Often he did. At his disposal was an army of slaves and personal attendants. Any woman could be at his beck and call. Gold, silver, jewels, every kind of wealth in the world is in his treasury and his for the taking. He was, of course, the world's greatest celebrity, the most famous man of his age. Well, there's an old saying that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. 
And the latter part of this emperor's reign was marked by internal dissension and discord and corruption, intrigues and plots against him. And as time went on, he became insatiably, insanely cruel and brutal and tyrannical. And the people closest to him, the people in his inner circle, became more and more treacherous and disloyal. And finally, this emperor died at the age of 45, assassinated by his own people. It is believed that his own wife was one of the conspirators. Now, when I give my youth retreats, I always ask this question, and no one, nobody among the retreatants has ever known the answer to it. I ask, what was his name? Well, his name was Domitian. Now, here was a man, one of the most powerful men ever to walk the face of the earth, one of the richest, one of the most famous of his time, All worldly power and honor and glory and fortune and fame and pleasure were his, so much so he proclaimed himself to be God, and no doubt he thought that he was God for a short time. Domitian. How many of you would have known his name? How many of you would have known that? Raise your hand if you knew that. Be honest. No. See? Nobody knew who Domitian was. Hmm? And the reason why nobody knew is precisely because the world has long ago, long ago forgotten that man. His pleasure was passing and his glory faded away very quickly. And in spite of the fact that he had everything this world had to offer, he did not have peace. He didn't live in peace and he certainly did not die in peace. And now, 2,000 years later, for all practical purposes... The world does not even know that man was ever alive. Here's another question for you. Where is that man now? Hmm? Where is that man spending eternity? Well, we don't know. Nobody knows. But if I had to bet on it, I would say that I would not want to be in his toga, and neither would you. Hmm? Jesus said, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? All this, of course, leads up to a last question. Where will you be 2,000 years from now? 2,000 years from now, who will remember you? If the world did not long remember that emperor who was so powerful that he made himself out to be God... How long do you think this miserable world is going to remember you when you are gone? Who would ever know that you lived on this earth? Who will remember what you did on this earth? Where are you going to spend eternity? One thing is for sure, I guarantee you, someone will remember. Someone is going to remember what you did on this earth in every last little minute detail. And that someone, of course, is God. God will remember. That was 2,000 years ago. Now let's talk about two years ago. A couple years ago, about this time, the news and entertainment media was a buzz, fixated on the story of the life and death of Anna Nicole Smith. There was a great media sensation, a lot of Hollywood hype. And uh, in case you might have forgotten or you never knew this, Anna Nicole Smith was this gorgeous and vivacious blonde reminiscent of Marilyn Monroe who died at the age of 39 of a drug overdose. Now, Anna Nicole Smith started out as a dancer in a Texas men's club, and she caught the eye of an elderly Texas oil tycoon by the name of J. Howard Marshall. Now, J. Howard Marshall was not just a multimillionaire, he was a billionaire. And Anna Nicole knew exactly how to get what she wanted. (laughs) She married J. Howard Marshall when he was 89 years old, and he didn't live much longer after that. That's exactly what she was counting on. So she inherited a vast part of his oil fortune, $474 million. 
and $474 million made Anna Nicole Smith one of the richest women in the world. If ever there was a woman who made the American dream come true, it was Anna Nicole Smith. Think about this. She had it all. She had all the things the world tells women, especially young women, they ought to live and die for. She had all that money. She had all the beauty. In her prime, she was one of the most beautiful women in the country. All the time she had men at her beck and call, vying for her attention and her affection, and they fought over her. She was extremely promiscuous, always involved with a number of men at the same time. She had all the fame, all the glamour. Her picture was in just about every celebrity magazine and tabloid across the USA. She had her own reality TV show on cable for a time. She made the most of every minute she spent in the limelight. But in spite of it all, Come to find out, she was never at peace. She was never satisfied with what she had. There was always something wrong, always something missing in her life. And her life became a never-ending search for pleasure. Habitual partying, sex, drugs, and eventually the drugs became her downfall. Now, Anna Nicole had a son a teenage boy named Daniel, a fine-looking boy, who got involved in drugs through the influence of his mother. And uh, Daniel died suddenly of a drug overdose at the age of 16. Finally, Anna Nicole fell victim to her own addiction. She died of a massive overdose of prescription drugs. The results of the autopsy showed that she had nine powerful prescription drugs in her system when she died. And she was on medication for, among other things, anxiety, insomnia, and depression. When she died, it set off a national media feeding frenzy. They aired the videos of the last interviews that she had done, and they showed that Anna Nicole Smith was a tortured soul, a terribly, terribly unhappy woman. Now, believe me, I take no satisfaction, no pleasure in anyone's misfortune or downfall, neither should you. I pass no judgment on her. I say, may God have mercy on her soul. But there is, of course, a lesson in this for everyone. As far as the media is concerned, the public, the paparazzi, the American pop culture, she is already forgotten. She is already gone. You know how it is, out of sight, out of mind. But her story is a story that is as old as life itself. You see, all her beauty, all her glamour, the fame and the fortune and the sex and the drugs could not save her. They could not bring her the happiness she was searching for here on earth. And all the pleasure that she enjoyed in life, of course, it did not last, it did not satisfy, it did not bring peace. That was two years ago. I could talk about one year ago. Michael Jackson. Again, it's a story as old as life itself. But you see, my brothers and sisters, here's the important point. Remember this. Pleasure and happiness are not necessarily the same. They are not synonymous. Happiness is a state of being, but pleasure, worldly pleasure, is fleeting. That is to say, it can't last It can't bring true joy and it can't bring true peace because, precisely because, it does not fulfill the purpose for which we have been created. Union with God. Eternal life in Christ. In God's heavenly kingdom and that perfect joy and peace of the beatific vision. The point is this. The hedonistic lifestyle that drives and dominates everything in this country today Life spent in pursuit of pleasure, 
vain pleasure. Pleasure for its own sake, pleasure as an end in itself, sooner or later, one way or the other, always leads to ruin. Self-destruction. Because only God can give the kind of true, lasting peace and joy and happiness all of us are searching for. If there would just be some way I could get this message across to our young people, I could save many of them an entire lifetime of heartache. Remember this. Sin cannot bring peace. On the contrary, it is the ultimate source of all human unhappiness and conflict, pain, suffering, misery, and death. It is all traceable in one way or another from the beginning to the end, from Adam and Eve to the present moment, to sin. And to have true peace and freedom, peace of soul, that is, we have got to be free of it. Peace is the gift of God, and it is lost through sin, mortal sin. Ultimately, there is only one thing that can separate us from God, and that is mortal sin. And what a tragedy it is that there are many parishes around this country where Catholics have not even heard the term mortal sin in more than 30 years. Sin disrupts the whole order of God's creation. Case in point. More than 20 years ago, In 1987, there was a movie that came out that got to be a kind of a cult classic. And it was very popular, especially among white-collar types. Uh, The movie was called Wall Street. And uh, in this movie, the actor Michael Douglas played an unscrupulous Wall Street banker named Gordon Gecko. At one point in the movie, Gordon Gecko is giving a speech to the shareholders... And he says this, greed is good, greed works, greed is right, greed clarifies, cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Back then people loved it. Good part of a whole generation, young corporate executive types took that and ran with it. Because it was part of the prevailing mentality of the age to this day, you see. (laughs) Their thinking was, yeah, that's right. Greed is good. Greed is right. Greed works. That's what makes the world go around. That's what drives the markets. That's what brings prosperity. That's what's going to make us rich. So, get all that you can any way that you can. Now, here we are, a little over 20 years later. Where did it get us? Where did all that greed get us? We are told that we are now going through the worst economic mess since the Great Depression. And friends, I want to tell you, it ain't over by a long shot. Don't kid yourself. Now, you can talk about government regulation and deregulation. You can talk about the collapse of the housing market. Uh, you can talk about all the bad mortgages and the subprime mess, the bank failures and the bailouts and all the rest. But I would suggest to you that when you cut to the bottom of this whole debacle, there, once again, you will find sin. There, you will find greed. Greed. In the same year that movie came out, 1987, Pope John Paul II wrote an encyclical letter called On Reconciliation and Penance. And the object of that letter was to try to turn back the great loss of the sense of sin in the world today and to try to get Catholics especially back to a life of repentance. To get Catholics back to the forgotten sacrament, the sacrament of penance, the greatest channel of God's mercy. And in that letter... Um, Pope John Paul made this statement, and I'm paraphrasing here, right? He said that every crisis, every disaster that arises in the course of human affairs can be traced back to a collectivity of personal sins. A collectivity of personal sins. 
So here we are again. God is right and men are wrong. Greed is not good. Greed is not right. Greed does not work. Sin disrupts the whole order of God's creation. Now, the founding fathers of this country understood all this very well, and all you have to do is to read their writings and you will see. For example, President John Adams, who was called the father of the American Revolution, second president, said this. No government on the face of the earth has the capacity to restrain the power of unbridled human passions without the support of religion. George Washington, called the father of our country, the first president, in 1789 left the American people a warning, talking about true religion. Judeo-Christian revelation, he said this, Democracy cannot be sustained without morality, and morality cannot be sustained without religion. Simple common sense principle. No morality, no democracy, not for law. Again, obviously the founding fathers of this country understood this principle very clearly, but the politicians of our time don't understand it. They just don't get it. You see, for them... The principle of the separation of church and state means the separation of God from life. Official banishment of God from public life. And you don't have to be a prophet to see that this agnostic mentality, this secularism is leading this country down to ruin. And it is going to happen very, very quickly if we don't stand up against it. Hmm? Remember this, sin will not bring you peace. Don't kid yourself. Oh, you can have a superficial external kind of peace. You can have a false sense of security. You can dull and deaden your conscience through habitual sin, but you will never have true, lasting peace. It will all catch up with you in the end, as it always does, one way or the other. Now, you can try to find your fulfillment in sinful relationships and lifestyles, you can adopt the contraceptive mentality. You can try to adopt the playboy mentality. You might have the kind of false peace that somebody like you, Hefner, has got walking around in his bathrobe for the last 60 years. <laughs> the poor, fallen human nature remains. The internal, addictive, Compulsive dynamics of sin will be operative in your life. For example, surrender to lust, impurity in thought and in action leads to sexual addiction, obsession, and finally perversion. That is why pornography has become, spiritually speaking, America's most deadly addiction, especially for men. Avarice. Greed leaves the soul always wanting more, more, more. The greedy person is never satisfied. Enough is never enough. Because material goods cannot satisfy the deepest longings of the human spirit. The alcoholic is never satiated. He's got to battle the addiction. There's the old saying, one drink is too many, a thousand are not enough. The drug abuser gets hooked. And the high always wears off and there's got to be more and more bigger doses to get the same kind of high. The end is addiction. Destruction of the person in mind and body and very often the ruin of the people closest to him. The ruin of the people that he loves. Jesus said, those who commit sin become slaves of sin. That is the bondage of the human will. The surrender of the soul of ice. Now, many people try to deceive themselves by claiming that they're following their own consciences. And, of course, the vast majority never bother to form and inform their consciences according to the content of God's revelation, the timeless teaching of the church. Um, they claim that they're following their own consciences. What they are really following are their own passions, their own lusts. Their own perverse desires. So there are two kinds of peace. 
The false peace people make for themselves, the surrender to vice, compromise with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And then there is the true, lasting peace that is the gift of God. Here's the question. Do you have that kind of peace in your life? Do you really have peace? If you do, what kind do you have? How do you know the difference? Here's the test. Jesus said, a good tree bears good fruits, and an evil tree bears rotten fruits. He said, by their deeds you will know them. The Apostle St. Paul, his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, says this. Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh wars against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other. So you may not do what you want. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, rivalry, jealousy, outbursts of fury, acts of selfishness, dissensions, factions, occasions of envy, drinking bouts, orgies and all the like. I warn you as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So again, true peace is the gift of God. It is the fruit of the Holy Spirit dwelling in your soul, and it is the only kind that is going to last. Here's the message. Remember, you can have that kind of peace. You can have interior peace. Peace of soul, even when there is great turmoil going on all around you, as long as you are at peace with God. You can have that kind of peace no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how big or how bad or how many your sins have been, no matter how many years you have been away from the sacraments. No matter how dark or hopeless things might seem to be right now, you can have peace in the divine mercy as long uh, as you are willing to repent and turn away from sin. Here's the key point. The source of our peace is the sure knowledge that God loves us. Let me say that again for you. The source of our peace is the sure knowledge that God loves us. God loves you and God's love will never fail you. God made you and God did not bring you into this world to abandon you. And if you think that he would, it can only be because you don't know him. If you've got it, and God forbid, get rid of the idea that your sins are bigger than the mercy of God. God offers the gift of his mercy. We've got to cooperate with that grace. Now, there are two really, really bad responses to the mercy of God. Two extremes, sins against the virtue of hope. The first is despair. Despair, the idea that my sins are too big and too bad and too many for God to forgive. The idea that God doesn't really love me. God is not going to forgive me no matter what. So give it up. No use. It's too late for me. That's despair. I've heard despair called the capital city of hell. And the second, the more prevalent in this day and age, is presumption. Presumption is the idea I can commit as many sins as I want to, and I don't have to repent. I don't have to change my ways. I'm going to heaven anyway, because that's how loving and how merciful God is. It just doesn't matter. It's a deadly trap. Hmm? Listen to the words of Archbishop Fulton Sheen from his book entitled Peace of Soul. The figure upon the cross is not a KGB agent or a Gestapo inquisitor, but a divine physician. who only asks that we bring our wounds to him in order that he may heal them. If our sins be as scarlet... They shall be washed white as snow. If they be as red as crimson, they shall be made white as wool. Was it not he who told us, I say to you, that even so, there shall be more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner than over ninety-nine just? In the story of the prodigal son, did he not describe the father as saying, Let us eat and make merry, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again, was lost and is found? 
Why is there more joy in heaven for the repentant sinner than for the righteous? Because God's attitude is not judgment, but love. God's attitude is not judgment, but love. End quote. Now, there are many people who have a terribly distorted notion of what God is really like. A very, very harsh, legalistic picture of God's attitude toward us. Right? You know, God is not like the divine traffic cop who is out there waiting to catch you in the act. God is not like the eternal state trooper hiding on the other side of the little hill with his radar gun waiting to catch you breaking the law and hovering over you ready to pounce. So you can say, gotcha. Gotcha, now you're in mortal sin. Now you're going to hell. (laughs) Right? No. No, um, That's not God's will for anyone. Now make no mistake... If you die in a state of mortal sin, you will go to hell. Nothing has changed. That is as much a part of God's word to us as any other. But that's not God's will for anyone. God is that loving father of the gospel who waited with open arms for the prodigal son to come home and then said, Rejoice with me, because this son of mine was dead, now he's alive again. Why did the prodigal son say that? Why did the father say that about the prodigal son? Son wasn't dead. He wasn't physically dead. He was spiritually dead. Dead in mortal sin. And the divine mercy brought him back to life again. The mercy of God is often called God's greatest attribute. The mercy of God is deserved by none but available to all by the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the most powerful channel of God's mercy? It is the sacrament of penance. Confession. Spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, positively, the best source of peace in the whole world, say what you will. You know, we say that the human person is a body-soul composite. And the body and the soul work in harmony with each other. Right? Right? Think of the working of the human body. For example, you get something in your eye, some foreign matter. If you splash some chemical in your eye, you get a speck of dust or dirt or a shard in your eye. What's going to happen? Immediately, your eye is going to tear up to get it out. It's going to bother you until you get it out. You will not get relief until you flush it out. You get a splinter in your hand or a shard of broken glass in your foot, you're going to be uncomfortable. Your body will not leave you in peace until you get it out. If you eat something that doesn't agree with you, something that you can't digest, you're going to get a tummy ache. You can try an antacid. You can try Rolaids. You might try Pepto-Bismol. You may be up all night. You may have to throw it up because your stomach wants it out. You get a toothache. You ever had a bad toothache? (laughs) If you have, you know very well, you will not get any relief until you get to the dentist and get it pulled out. Because pain, discomfort, is your body's way of telling you that something is wrong. And if you try to ignore it, If you try to repress it, live with it, eventually it may get worse. It may get infected or impacted or whatever. So it is with the soul. Feelings of guilt, anxiety, and depression may be the soul's way of telling you that something is wrong. It is the voice of your conscience speaking to your heart. Something is there, in there, that will not leave you in peace And it's got to come out. And that's something, of course, is sin. Sin is the culprit, and it's got to come out. No matter how painful that process might be. 
Sin is the culprit and you got to get it out. you got to do it God's way. And God's way is confession for the forgiveness of sins. Why does the church put so much emphasis on confession, especially in the holy seasons of the year? Why do we go to confession at all for that matter? We go to confession simply because, precisely because, that is the way that God established for our sins to be forgiven. That is the way that Jesus Christ established for the forgiveness of mortal sins committed after baptism. That is the way that God established for us to do penance. To make reparation for our sins against God and against our neighbors. That's why in the gospel Jesus said, unless you do penance, you'll likewise perish. Right? Jesus Christ gave us the sacrament of his mercy on that first Easter, Easter Sunday evening when he appeared to the apostles in the upper room after his resurrection. And we read about this in the gospel of St. John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. Now, no doubt you've heard these verses many times before, but uh, listen again carefully. Try to draw out the deeper meaning. Um, listen specifically for the word peace. On the evening of that first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain are retained. Now, to our fundamental friends, I say, please don't try to tell me that our Lord's words in the Gospel of St. John here have no meaning, no purpose, no relevance. Hmm? The Gospel shows us clearly that our Lord gave his disciples the power to forgive sins in his name. And it shows us also that there is a link, an inseparable link, a divine connection between peace, the Holy Spirit, the reception of the Holy Spirit, and the ministry of reconciliation. That is, confession for the forgiveness of sins. Our Lord's words in the gospel presuppose confession. Think about this, right? Our Lord gave his disciples the power to forgive sins in his name. He gave them the power to forgive sins. He did not give them the power to read minds. How could the disciples know which sins to forgive and which to retain if no one would confess? This is a theological no-brainer. It's a matter of common sense. And when you've confessed your sins to the best of your ability and the best of your memory, and you haven't held anything back deliberately, and you're truly sorry for all your sins, and you have that firm purpose of amendment, which means that you're going to try with the help of God's grace to avoid the same sins in the future, with a valid sacramental absolution, you always leave that confession with that confident assurance of God's complete forgiveness. That's something that should fill you with a sense of relief. Like a burden is lifted off of your shoulders. It'll fill you with a sense of peace and the joy that comes with having a clear conscience before God. This is the beauty of the sacrament of reconciliation. What I'm saying is, Confession will make a new person out of you. Spiritually, a new man, a new woman out of you because that sacramental confession is a personal meeting, a personal encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. The incomparable power of that 10, 15, 20 minute sacramental meeting with Christ can change hearts and lives forever. I've seen it time and time again over the years. Yet on my years as a spiritual director and confessor, some of the most tortured souls that I've ever known have been women who have had abortions. As they get older and the reality of what they have done sinks in, nature and conscience will not allow them to forget. A woman making the commitment to turn back to God will ordinarily face two big challenges. The first, 
is to truly believe that God really does love them. God still has a plan for their lives that is going to end in eternal glory. If only they cooperate with the graces that God wants to give. It's to be able to truly accept the mercy, the forgiveness that God wants to give to them. And the second, by far the greater challenge, is to be able to forgive themselves. And I always say this. If you have a problem with confession... If you have a problem truly interiorizing and accepting the mercy of God and his complete forgiveness, think about this. Think about the Apostle St. Paul. Started out anything but a saint. He was the young Pharisee named Saul who persecuted Christians. Saul, you may remember, took part in the killing of St. Stephen. And before he died, St. Stephen prayed to our Lord to forgive his persecutors. And our Lord heard the prayer of St. Stephen in a big way. Saul had a dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus. Remember, he was blinded by a flash of light, was knocked off of his horse. And he heard the voice of Jesus Christ saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice that our Lord did not say, why are you persecuting the church? Why are you persecuting Christians? He said, why are you persecuting me? The church is the mystical body of Christ. We are his members by virtue of our baptism. But think about this. If St. Paul had for a moment doubted the love of God and the power of his mercy, he could never have done what he did. He could never have gone on to become one of the two greatest apostles and the greatest missionary in the history of the church. You know, I always say this. If a retreat like this one, if it helps just one person, if it brings just one soul closer to Christ, if it strengthens the faith of just one soul, if it brings about just one good, sincere confession, it's all worthwhile for the sake of that one soul. That is the infinite value of a single soul in God's sight. And that is my greatest joy, my greatest consolation as a priest. And I once heard somebody say, Well, you priests made up all this stuff about confession. Because you want to hear all the dirt. Oh, you want to hear all the scandals. It's a lot of nonsense, of course. I'm sure the other priests would agree with me that hearing confessions doesn't tell me how bad people are. On the contrary, it tends to tell me how good people are. Over the years, I have heard so many beautiful, humble, sincere confessions that have made me stop and give thanks to God there on the spot and pray to God and say, Lord, give me that kind of humility. Give me the grace to make that kind of a humble confession. That's edifying to me. That's something that strengthens my faith. But John Paul II, in a homily he gave in March of 1980, said this. The apostolate of confession must deserve a special reward in heaven, for it is surely the best source of peace and joy there is in the whole world. Those confessionals scattered about the world where men declare their sins don't speak of the severity of God. They speak of his mercy. And all those who approach the confessional sometimes after many years weighed down with mortal sins, in the moment of getting rid of this intolerable burden, find at last a long-for relief. They find joy and tranquility of conscience, which outside confession they will never be able to find anywhere. Let me ask you something. When is the last time you made a really good examination of conscience? When was the last time you made a really sincere, heartfelt confession? If you haven't done it in a while, now is the time to make a new start. Hmm? Our Lord is always waiting for you with his infinite love in the sacrament of his infinite mercy. I'll leave you with our Lord's words to St. Faustina Kowalska of the Divine Mercy Devotion. Jesus says, My mercy is greater than your sins and those of the entire world. Who can measure the extent of my goodness? For you I descended from heaven to earth. 
For you I allowed myself to be nailed to the cross. For you I let my sacred heart be pierced with a lance, thus opening wide the source of my mercy for you. Come then with trust to draw graces from this fountain. I never reject a contrite heart. Your misery has disappeared in the depths of my mercy. Do not argue with me about your wretchedness. You will give me pleasure if you hand over to me all your troubles and griefs, and I shall heap upon you all the treasures of my grace. Oh, 